Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, very attractive uh, program of uh, 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 which uh, the title the follow up of post PCI patients. Uh, as you all know that we celebrated the World Heart Day yesterday and this is the uh, concluding uh, program of a week long uh, a series of programs on different topics of cardiology and this topic uh, is a very uh, important for all the cardiologists and as, as well as for internists and the general practitioners as well who care for the cardiac patient particularly after a uh, cor percutaneous coronary intervention and this is a bread and butter of percutaneous coronary intervention and it is a very uh, appropriate that the National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute uh, the center which uh, performs the highest number of PCI uh, uh, in number and as well as the complex PCI as well uh, has organized this program and I welcome the speakers and the learned panelists, uh, particularly our uh, mentor, Professor Fazila Tunnesa Malik, uh, uh, Professor Badiuz Zaman, Professor Abdul Wadu Choudhury, uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Ashok Datta, and uh, others as well. Uh, so we have uh, three speakers uh, in today's program. The first speaker will be Dr. Arun Maski. He is one of our homegrown uh, cardiologist and he graduated uh, as a cardiologist uh, from National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases and he's uh, presently working as a professor and senior consultant at uh, Shahid Gangalal National Heart Center Kathmandu Nepal and the next speaker uh, will be Dr. Kalimuddin and uh, the last speaker will be Dr. Mir Ishtrakuzzaman they will be speaking on different aspects of follow up of uh, post PCI patient. So, with the permission of the chair, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Onunun Maski to start his deliberation. And the title of his presentation is How to Follow Up a Post PCI Patient. Over to Dr. Onunun Maski. Thank you, Khalid Bhai. I was your student. You were registrar in NICVD. Thank you, Fazila ma'am. I was your student in NICVD. It's nice to learn from you all and all the panelists. So I was given a topic and it was said, how to follow up a post-PCI patient. And they are asked specifically for me to, this is for postgraduate residents and fellows. So my talk would be how to follow up our post-PCI patients. So let's start a case. This is a 50 years old male diabetes presented with four hours of chest pain and he had primary PCI to LAD with drug leading stents. This is his uh, final pictures. Second case is uh, this was a 44 years old gentleman. He had primary PCI to left main to LAD. I do not have his CDs and he came back five months back and attended our emergency with acute stent thrombosis post primary PCI five months back. And this patient had undergone primary PCI to left main LAD and with a two stent strategy, final kissing balloon, pots, everything was done for the sake of time. I've not included all pictures. And this picture looks reasonable after post PCI in acute stent thrombosis. This is a third uh, lady, third case. This is a female, 35 years old lady. She had a elective PCI to LAD and sunken flex. These are, this is our final pictures. So reviewing all three pictures, how should we follow our post PCI patients? First case, STEMI patients undergoing primary PCI diabetes Second case, young gentleman, acute strength thrombosis in the left main, had uh, primary PCI five months back. And third case was elective PCI, double vessel disease, and is action fraction 35%. So what would be the strategy? How should we follow these patients? 
look at uh, coronary artery disease. Now it has been classified into two categories. One, acute coronary syndrome, which includes STEMI and non-STEMI. Second is the 2019 guidelines, they have changed the stable coronary artery disease into chronic coronary syndromes, and they have categorized into six categories. One, suspected coronary artery disease with stable angina or dyspnea. Second is suspected coronary artery disease with heart failure or LV dysfunctions. Third is asymptomatic or symptomatic patient stabilized within one year after ACS or recent revascularizations. Fourth category is after one year. Fifth is patient presenting with a vasospastic or microvascular disease. And the sixth category is asymptomatic subjects in whom coronary artery is detected as screening. The PCI could be elective, primary, or rescue. So what is the goal of uh, primary PCI? It's the goal of uh, PCI. Except in patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome where you do primary PCI, in case of patients with chronic coronary syndrome, the goal is to improve quality of life, make him free from angina, improve physical performance, prevent patient becoming symptomatic, prevent myocardial infarction and heart failure and prevent cardiac deaths. In those chronic coronary syndromes, except in patients with left main, triple vessel disease with uh, proximal lesion or LV dysfunctions, the mortality benefit is not seen. In these three categories of patients, only mortality benefits are seen. So even after uh, PCIs with the currently available drug lifting stents, the rate of stent thrombosis is less than 1% per year. And this is 02 to 0.4% per year thereafter. The stent with stenosis, despite our best efforts, occurs 5% at one year follow-up. The recurrence of major cardiac adverse cardiac events in native vessel disease progression, it occurs less than 5% at one year follow-up. The persistence of angina occurs either due to incomplete coronary revascularizations or even if the patient has uh, complete coronary vascularization due to microvascular angina or vascular spastic angina occurs nearly in 30% of the cases. So what should we do and how should we follow post-discharge? Preferably this patient should be followed up in one week. They should have thorough general examinations, pulse, blood pressure, do auscultation of heart, lung and other systems as required and we should always see the puncture sites. Nowadays, the, most of the patients they undergo, the access site is radial, and some of the patients might have undergone also femoral. So the access site, we should see bruises, hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, or any other complications. They should have investigations with 12 lead CCs at rest, just to compare what was there and what is now. Do routine lab to test like hemoglobin, electrolytes, complete blood counts, renal function test to see contrast induced nephropathy, blood sugar, liver function test, and other investigations. And the echocardiography should be done. If previously not done, it should be done. And if it's previously done, in case of stable coronary artery disease, should be done after, preferably after three months if the ejection fraction is low, because many of the patient would have stunt or uh, hibernating myocardiums. And the drug treatment in this patient would be dual antiplatelet therapy, statins, ACI or ARVs, beta blockers. If the patient is in oral anticoagulation, they will be uh, in atrial fibrillation, they would be in, uh, they would require oral anticoagulations. And if the patient is in chest pain, they require nitrates. So we'd like to categorize patients. What is the ischemic risk, what is the bleeding risk? And based on that, we can go for a DAPTs. And whether the PCI was electric PCI or primary PCIs, and what was the number of vessels like single vessel disease or multi-vessel disease, or whether the PCI was done in left men, left men. And they should have a regular follow-up every three to six months based on their symptoms. If symptom-free, they can even have a six monthly follow-up. And the most important thing is they need to have lifestyle modification. They, have, they should attain cardiac rehabilitation and should be given advice on diets. 
So coronary artery disease manifestation may present as angina, or they may present as acute coronary syndrome with myocardial infarctions. They may even present as a signs of heart failure like dyspnea or ischemia, can present as arrhythmia, or they may even present as sudden cardiac death. So this may be of different presentation of coronary heart disease. And we all know that these patients required dual antiplatelet therapies. ACI and ARVs are indicated post MI, especially in patients with heart failure with low ejection fractions, diabetes and hypertension. Beta blockers are also indicated in chronic uh, post MI patients, especially they are beneficial if they have LV systolic dysfunctions or even if they are helpful in systolic heart failures. For patients with the chest pain, nitrates are helpful. And if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, they required oral anticoagulations. The target BP should be around 130 to 80 millimeter mercury. If the diabetes, then HbA1 should be less than seven. And there should be intense statin therapy to uh, lower the lip, uh, LDL goal. Currently, the guideline says reduce LDL less than 100, preferably to 55 milligram per deciliters. Give maximum tolerate dose of statins. If not, then add ezetimibide. If both does not achieve the goal, then you can add PCSK9 inhibitors. And important is they should have a cardiac re uh, rehabilitation and lifestyle modifications. They should be advised for healthy diets. Healthy diets include plenty of fruits, vegetable, nuts, vegetable, lean vegetable, fish, and ox to avoid trans fats, red meat, refined carbohydrates, sweetened beverages. If the patient is overweight, obese, they should be advised to reduce weight. They should uh, do regular activities like 30 to 60 minutes of intense physical activities in most days and advice to stop tobacco or smoking if they are smokers. And the most important thing of post-PCI is dual antiplatelet therapies. The aspirin should be loaded 300 mg and maintenance is 7, 7, uh, 75 to 162 milligram daily. Clopidogrel 600 is loading dose followed by 75 milligram daily. The newer agents are prasugal and ticagrelor. 60 milligram is prasugal loading dose and daily dose is 10 mg. Important is should avoid Prasugel, if the weight is less than 60, A is more than 75, and previous TIS. So we even advise giving 5 mg uh, Prasugel if weight is 60 kg, less than 60 kg. Tika is 180 is the loading dose, and 90 mg twice daily is the daily dose. And if the patient is on Tika Grol, aspirin dose should be less than 100 mg per day. So before deciding antiplatelet therapies, we need to know what are the ischemic events and how is the risk of ischemia. These are the categories where the ischemic risk is very high. If the patient has prior stent thrombosis on adequate antiplatelet therapies, if the patient has the stent, stenting of the last remaining patent coronary arteries, diffuse multivessel disease, especially in diabetic patients, chronic kidney disease with creatine clearance less than 60 ml per minute, at least three stents are implanted, at least three lesions are treated, Bifurcation lesion with two stents implanted, total stent tens more than 60 and, uh, millimeter, and to, uh, treatment of chronic total occlusions are regarded as high ischemic events. Another is uh, we have to judge what is the bleeding risk. The bleeding risk is categorized by BARC, Bleeding Academia Research Consortium. That there are different major and minor factors like if the patient is in oral anticoagulation, uh, low platelet counts, bleeding diastasis, liver disease, active cancers. If the patient is planned on surgery and DAPTs, if the recent history of trauma surgery, if the patient has stroke or intracranial hemorrhage, if uh, prior bleeding of bleeding or transfusion histories, anemia, renal disease, age more than 75, or if the patient is taking NACIDs, then these patients are high risk for bleeding risks, so we should categorize them as high bleeding risks. So what would be the duration of DAPT in patients who are on, who had uh, post-PCIs? 
So we'll have to judge the uh, bleeding risk and stent thrombosis. If the bleeding risk is high, then it should be reduced. And if the ischemic risk is high, then the dual antiplatelet therapy should be continued for a long period of time. So these are the guidelines. We say if the patient has PC, uh, PCI in acute coronary syndrome, this patient should have DAPT at least for 12 months. And based on individual patient, they can be extended further beyond one year. And if the patient has high bleeding risk, then minimum six months of DAPT should be done, should be given in patients with acute coronary syndromes. If the patient has uh, stable coronary artery disease or post PCI for bare metal stents, one month of DAPT and continue aspirins. And for DS in stable coronary artery disease, six months should be given dual antiplatelet therapies. And most, sometimes the patient would be in atrial fibrillations, so they may require oral anticoagulations. So oral anticoagulations should be decided by charts vas score. We know that charts vas score is congestive heart failure, hypertension, age more than 75, diabetes, stroke, uh, thromboembolism, vascular disease, age 65 to 74 years, and female sex categories. Charts vas score more than two is class one indication, and chart vas score more than one is 2A indication. So this patient would be advised for oral anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillations. So what does the guideline say of triple therapies with DAPT and warfarin? If the ischemic risk is low, is high, then give triple therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, and oral anticoagulation for six months. After six months, six to 12 months, give dual antiplatelet therapy with oral anticoagulation, either with aspirin or propidogrel. In case of uh, patients where high bleeding risk, triple therapy should be given for one month, dual therapy up to 12 months, and after 12 months, only oral anticoagulations. If the bleeding is very, risk is very high, then they should be given dual antiplatelet, dual therapy with oral warfarin, oral anticoagulation, and clopidogrel. This is a guideline. So to, for easy to remember, if the ischemic risk is high, six months triple therapy, dual therapy six to 12 months, and after 12 months, just oral anticoagulations. If the bleeding risk is high, give one month triple therapy, up to 12 months dual therapy, and after 12 months, give oral anticoagulations. Among the oral anticoagulations, novel oral anticoagulation, NOAC, should be preferred or vitamin K antagonists. Clopidogrel should be choice, not the prasugrel and ticagrel. The dose of aspirin should be less than 100 milligram daily. The routine PPI should be used and the indication for oral anticoagulation is based on charts vas score. How do we switch uh, between uh, different uh, P2 Y12 inhibitors? If you are shifting from clopidogrel, prasugrel or ticagrel, we should give in accurate setting, give a loading dose. In case of prasugrel and ticagrel, give after uh, 24 hours. In case of uh, chronic setting, we can shift the clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrel after 24 hours of those doses. And most of this patient might even go for a non-cardiac surgeries. The current recommendation is if the patient has dog eating stents, the DAPT should be continued for six months. After six months, this patient should be referred for surgery if the patient is on uh, dog eating stents. And if the bleeding, if the delay of surgery risk is greater than stent thrombosis, then it can be considered between three to six months, but it's recommended that we should not advise elective surgery before three months of uh, dog eating stents. Similarly, in the bare metal stents, uh, this uh, surgery should be advised after one month of uh, DA, uh, after one month of DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapies. So this is a summary so of DAPT and elective surgery. DAPT increases bleeding risk of surgery. Risk of stent thrombosis is high on stabbing DAPT. So if the patient is going for elective surgery, DAPT should be stopped. Can, uh, can be stopped after six months. 
and after bare metal stents after one month. And see, the, a lot of this patient present with angina. As early mentioned, nearly 20 to 40 percent of this patient may present with angina during follow-up of one month, one year. So we'll have to dis, uh, distinguish what whether this is a cardiac or non-cardiac. The typical angina means patients will have constricting dis discomfort in front of chest, neck, jaw, or shoulder or arm, which is precipitated by physical exertions and relieved by rest or nitro night rest within five minutes. If they have Two of these categories, they are known as atypical angina. And if it's meets one or none of these categories, then these are non-anginal chest pain, which we can ignore. And Canadian uh, classic, uh, Cardiovascular Society CCS classification, just to recall, one is angina on strenuous exertion, two on motor exertions, three on mild exertion, and angina at rest is class four, CCS class four. So what are the structural and functional alteration chronic, uh, coronary circulation, which is responsible for persistence or recurrence of angina after percutaneous coronary interventions? This uh, data is very important. Up to 20 to 40% of the patient present with angina after successful PCI at one year follow. The cause may be, maybe there was some residual disease post PCI or disease has progressed or uh, this patient may have instant stenosis or instant thrombosis. Uh, they may have developed diffuse atherosclerosis. Some of this patient might have intramyocardial breathes and some of this patient may develop spontaneous coronary artery dissections. These are the structural cause. The functional cause could be this patient might have epicardial coronary artery spasms or the epicardial coronary arteries, arteries are normal, but they may have my a microvascular dis, uh, dysfunction leading into anginas. So microvascular angina is angina, issues changes, but without coronary, without epicardial coronary spasm by angiographies. Vasospastic angina is angina at rest, frequent, frequently nocturnal, but they have a preserved effort tolerance. Microvascular angina is a prolonged chest pain, which is not responsive to nitrates. So we have seen a patient uh, with a strength thrombosis. This strength thrombosis is defined as thrombus within the uh, stent of five millimeter of proximal or uh, distal two stents. And they, they will have acute ischemic symptoms with the changes in ECGs and typical rise and fall of biomarkers. If it occurs within one day, this is called acute strength thrombosis. Within one month is subacute strain thrombosis. More than one month is late strain thrombosis. And after one year is very late strain thrombosis. The cause could be neoarthrosclerosis, stenosis. It could be uncovered strain uh, struts, or maybe under expansion, malposition, or other causes. And strain risk stenosis is also quite common. The instant risk stenosis with current droglet stents is 5% in one year. This is luminating narrowing, more than 50% diameter stenosis within the stent segments or within five millimeter of stent A's. The common cause is new intimal proliferations. Other cause could be new atherosclerosis. Or the, it could be caused due to stents like under expansion, fracture, or malpositions. And the classify is at one, two, three, four, less than 10 mm, more than 10 mm beyond stents. And if it's totally occluded, it's a type four. So how do you approach these patients who present with persistent or recurrent angina post PCIs? If this patient has recurrent angina post PCI, take a thorough history to clinical examination with ECG and routine blood tests. If the patient presents with acute coronary syndrome, this patient is urgent coronary angiography and revascularization as per the anatomy. If the patient presents with chronic uh, coronary syndrome or chronic stable angina, we should do functional imagings. And if it's negative, then this, is, this could be a non-cardiac cause of chest pain and this should be evaluated. If this is positive with the uh, regional malvus and mantis, then coronary angiogram should be done. If the lesions are tight, this should they require repeat uh, percutaneous coronary uh, interventions. If there's an intimate stenosis, then this patient requires functional assessment with a 
fractional flow reserves or IFR, IFR. And if there's a mild stenosis, then they should be treated medically. If this patient have positive ECG angina, but without wall motion abnormalities, they should be given optimal medical therapy, maximum medical therapy. And if the symptom persists, then they should be advised for coronary angiogram and, and, your, uh, and then revascularizations accordingly. To summarize those uh, slides, if the patient has persistent or recurrent angina post PCI, they should be advised stress ECG or stress imaging like stress echocardiography, stress MRI, paid up SPECT scans. And the test depends on patient characteristics, local expertise or availability of uh, tests like stress ECG, stress echo are quite commonly available and these are the common tests we do routinely. And how do you categorize those uh, patients based on this test as high risk? If the exercise uh, ECG in patients with exercise ECG, if the cardiovascular mortality is more than 3% per year according to Duke Tedmi scores, in SPECT or PET perfusion, it's amazing. Area of ischemia is more than 10% of left ventricular myocardium. The stress echocardiography is three or more of the 16 segments which shows stress-induced hypokinesia or kinesia. In cardiac MRI, if more than two of the 16 segments, if they show stress in part, stress perfusion defects, coronary CT angio or invasive coronary angiogram, if they have triple vessel disease with uh, proximal stenosis, left main or proximal anterior descending arteries, and those borderline lesions, we should do invasive functional testing if FFR is less than 0 0.8 or IFR is 0 0.89, then this fall into high event risk and these patients should undergo angiograms. So in invasive angiogram post PCI is indicated if the patient presents with acute coronary syndromes. If they have chronic coronary syndromes where the symptoms are unresponsive to medical therapy, if the typical angina occurs at rest or low level of exercise or in Initial clinical evaluation with non-invasive tests, if they show high event rates, then they should be advised for coronary angiograms. And what are the duration where this patient with the dual antiplatelet therapy, they should be stopped before surgery. For ticagrelor, it should be stopped before three days. Clopidogrel is, sorry, is five days and prosigrel should be stopped seven days before elective surgeries. One of the issues which we encounter is bleeding and dual antiplatelet therapies. This dual antiplatelet therapies are associated with 40 to 50 percent increase in risks of major and minor bleedings. Serious GI complications occur two to four fold, which is more common in patients who take 75 to 300 milligram aspirin compared with controls. All doses of aspirins are associated with increased risks of bleedings. Risks of upper GI bleed, plain intraoral coated or buffer aspirin did not differ with the GI bleedings. Long term aspirin therapy, even with the low dose 50 milligram, may cause overt GI bleedings. Why this GI bleeding is important? If the patient has GI bleeding, the 30 day and one year mortality is high compared to patients with no GI bleedings. So, what is the role of uh, protein pump inhibitors? What are the guidelines say? The protein Pump inhibitors with the dual antiplatelet therapy should be used if the patient has previous history of ulcers or GI bleedings, or the patient is dual antiplatelet therapies, or if the patient is taking anticoagulation therapy, then they should be advised protein pump inhibitors. If these are not present, then, then, then we should risk for other risk factors like A is more than 60 years, if the patient is corticosteroids, if the patient has dyspepsia or gastroesophageal reflux symptoms, if two more than one risk factors are present, then PPI are indicated. So what is the complication of low dose aspirin therapy in peptic ulcers bleeding? If you look, compare these two groups of patients uh, with, with the peptic ulcer bleeding. The recurrent ulcer bleeding in aspirin group was 10.3 compared to 5.4, but all cause mortality was 1.3 compared to 12.9%. So among low-dose aspirin recipients who had peptic ulcer bleeding, 
continuous aspirin therapy may increase the risk of recurrent bleeding, but potentially reduces the mortalities. And let's see what is the, the aspirin discontinuation and mortalities. So in patients with uh, cardiovascular disease, discontinuation of low dose aspirin therapy after peptic ulcer bleeding increases the risk of death and acute cardiovascular events more than sevenfold. So how to start antiplatelet therapy after GI bleeds? So if the patient has GI bleed, this patient should be referred to gastroenterologist and hemostasis should be established. And the risk of GI bleeding is more after 72 hours. So once the hemostasis is established, wait aspirin for three to five days and after five, three to five days of hemostasis, then this aspirin can be restarted. There's not much data of propidoglul. Possibly it can be started after three to five days and the study and guideline do not say anything about dual antiplatelet therapies. So in conclusion, goal of PCI relief, goal of PCI is relief of signs, symptoms of myocardial ischemia. Should uh, give regular follow-up, advice for diet, DA, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy should be given. Statin, aggressive uh, statin should be given to reduce LDL. Drugs therapies like ACI, ARVs, or beta blockers, nitrates, as per the indications. There should be risk factor modifications. Patients should be asked to maintain healthy lifestyles. And there should be appropriate use of non-invasive tests and invasive coronary angiogram should be done as per the indications as discussed earlier. These guidelines and recommend help to make decisions, but the best management strategy for individual patient should be based on given conditions. And thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Heart Foundations. Thank you. Can you stop speaking, please? Okay, Maski, thank you very much for your very comprehensive and elaborate uh, deliberation on post-PCI follow-up. And you have possibly covered the, all the aspects uh, of post-PCI follow-up. Uh, as uh, uh, Fazila Madam has said, there is expected to be some overlapping of uh, topics uh, so it will be better for us if we uh, schedule the question answer session at the very end. So now I will uh, request the next speaker, Dr. Muhammad Kalimuddin, Assistant Professor of Cardiology, National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. And he will be emphasizing on the early follow-up of post-PCA patient, that is the in-hospital follow-up. As we know, the hospital stay is gradually being reduced because of more and more radial procedures are being done and many patients are discharged on the next day. And in some countries, the same day discharge is being also practiced. And for the femoral patients also, the use of vascular closure device has shortened the duration of hospital stay, but still there is a lot of things to be uh, emphasized and explored. So I would request uh, Dr. Mohammad Kalimuddin to start his presentation. Uh, regarding the early follow-up of post-PCI patient. Okay. Over to Dr. Kalimuddin. Thank you, sir. Honorable panelist and uh, moderator and learned audience, Assalamu alaikum and good evening. I am Dr. Mohammad Kalimuddin from National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute presenting in-hospital follow-up of post-PCI patients. The justification for a period of in-hospital observation following PCI is to detect and manage potential complications that are not apparent during the procedure, especially bleeding, vascular access complications, stent thrombosis, and recurrent ischemia. Over the past 30 years, the incidence of complications following PCI has declined. The overall incidence of in-hospital complications in the most recent report of the CAP PCI registry comprising over 6 lakh patients was 4.8%, especially stroke 0.2%, Bleeding within 72 hours, 1.4 percent. Pericardial tamponade, 0.1 percent. Heart failure, 0.9 percent. Acute kidney injury requiring hemodialysis, 0.2 percent. Strategies to minimize complications after PCI are the identification of patient at risk, 
that we can uh, uh, initially if we identify patient at risk and then uh, take proper care so risk of uh, completion will be less use of anticoagulation and antiplatelets before and after pci maintain hemostasis at the access site maintain fluid balance to prevent contact induced nephropathy ensure high quality nursing care to reduce complications physician should concern about symptoms of the patient after pci chest pain shortness of breath exercise pain pain in extremity back pain assess mental status is either due to stroke or over sedation respiratory status and signs of heart failure anaphylaxis check body for rash and check uh, pulse uh, there may be tachycardia due to anxiety drugs bleeding on pericardial tamponade and bradycardia due to drugs vasovagal response on retroperitoneal hemorrhage blood pressure may be high or low due to uh, if uh, high blood pressure we can think about anxiety or patient may miss drugs uh, before procedure and if hypo uh, if patient develop uh, hypotension they, there may be uh, different causes i will discuss later and if they, we should check puncture site rt dorsal is pedis pulse ecg and uh, echocardiography if needed ecg should be uh, 200 to 250 uh, second if uh, gp to be inhibitor used and if not used then 250 to 30 second drug titration should be done according to hemodynamic status of the patient and fluid balance to prevent contact induced nephropathy recheck previous document diagnosis is very important if acute coronary syndrome is the diagnosis then risk of complication will be more than chronic coronary syndrome as this patient receive more anticoagulation and uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and ecg to compare with previous ecg after pci hemoglobin level if uh, in case of bleeding and blood sugar high blood sugar associate with poor outcome so blood sugar should be uh, keep in uh, near normal uh, limit to reduce uh, with complication and serum creatinine level will be so we should know if it is high there will be risk of cns contact into nephropathy and physician should careful about regarding intake and output of the patient and platelet count if platelet count less than 1.5 lakh then risk of bleeding is more and a physician should be careful about this and uh, potassium level if potassium level is low there is risk of arrhythmia so potassium level should be corrected blood group rare blood group is uh, very important for arrangement of blood in case of blood transfusion low ejection fraction associated with poor outcome and previous history of pci or cbg also associated with higher in hospital outcome and information from cath lab we should know about type of pci if in case of primary pci there is risk of bleeding there is risk of stent thrombosis so physician should be careful then elective pci in adult pci there is risk of, uh, risk of uh, contact into nephropathy as there is same day angiogram and uh, pci single or multiple puncture if multiple puncture there is chance of uh, exercise bleeding complication duration of procedure it is also important because that patient may be hungry or for prolonged time and there may be hypovolemia and patient should uh, uh, keep in mind that there will be uh, indwelling catheter uh, indwelling sheet more uh, more in in situ so there is risk of bleeding complex pci cto late main bifurcating lesion or rotator ablation in case of cti we should uh, uh, concern about uh, bleeding which was not apparent in the cath lab because during uh, CTO there may be chance of pre, uh, perforation which was not evident during uh, procedure so we should keep in mind if patient develop hypotension there may be uh, bleeding uh, pericardial effusion and subsequently tamponade any age dissection is, is this uh, if there is any decision left then it should be uh, maybe thrombus, uh, stent thrombosis amount of contrast if i uh, use a high uh, do, uh, high amount of uh, contrast then there may be risk of contrast into nephropathy any arrhythmias in cath lab it is our full of sheet of uh, follow up sheet of a post pci patient in our hospital and instruction for manual compression of uh, manual compression always anticipate problems uh, secure venous access back of normal saline hanging atropine at bedside recycle cuff every 5 minutes while cooling have assistance nearby for c size 7 trench or less with typical hold time should be less uh, should be 20 minutes always aspirate the seat first to remove any clots if seat is not aspirating hold negative traction to on seat hold 2 to 10 centim 2 to 3 cm above seat insertion site this is where seat enters artery over femoral head full pressure 5 times and uh, 5 minutes and then 
light and pressure every five minutes. Vasovagal reaction, it is one of more common complications seen after prime PCI. Roughly incidence is 3%, triggered by pain and anxiety, particularly in the setting of hypovolemia. It occurs most commonly during removal of arterial sheath. Characterized by bradyarrhythmia associated with hypotension, nausea, and sweating, suggestion of painful stimulus, rapid volume administration, and atropine. IV is the treatment. Vital signs should be checked every five minutes until patient returns to prevagal episode level. Ex hypotension, excess site bleeding. There may be groin hematoma or uh, retropetal hemorrhage. We, we should check puncture site and pericardial effusion, coronary perforation resulting in cardiac tamponade. It may be due to cardiogenic shock, due to infarction or ongoing ischemia. It may be there may be a RV infarction if, if patient with uh, acute uh, STMI elevation and hypovolemia, high vasovagal syncope, arrhythmia, or sedation effect. If patient develops hypotension, duty doctor should take up action and he should check puncture site to see any puncture site uh, excess site bleeding. Do ECG to see new ECG changes if there are any uh, ischemia or uh, stent thrombosis and uh, echo. They check echo to identify pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade. Contus induced nephropathy. Contus induced nephropathy, also known as contus induced acute injury, is an iatrogenic renal injury that follows intravascular administration of radiopa contus media in suspected individual. The general accepted definition of CN is 25% relative increase or a 0.5 milligram per DL absolute increase in serum creatine level within 72 hours of contus exposure in the absence of an alternative explanation. The incidence of contus induced nephropathy in patient undergoing PCI ranges from 8 to 7 percent to 13.1 percent, undergoing primary PCI from 5 to 23.2 percent, and undergoing uh, PCI due to chronic total occlusion 3 percent. In our hospital, we have done uh, one year follow up of uh, our patient, and uh, we included 285 patients. Uh, uh, undergoing primary PCI and contus induced nephropathy was 14.7%, and elective PCI was 11.2%. Uh, risk factor, patient related risk factor for contus induced nephropathy are chronic kidney disease, heart failure, diabetes mellitus, uh, increased age, in, uh, intravascular volume depletion, systemic hypertension, nephrotoxic drugs, anemia, renal transplant, or hypoalbuminemia. And procedure related risk factors are the large volume of contus media. Intertail contest administration and multiple administration of contest media within 72 hours, osmolarity and iso uh, ionicity of contest media. And uh, isosmolar contest media is better than low, uh, low osmolar contest media. There is algorithm for prevention of uh, contest induced nephropathy. If there is moderate risks or high risks for contest induced nephropathy, then we discontinue. Uh, nephrotoxic medication for 48 hours and metformin for 24 hours and uh, consider high dose statin. Intravenous uh, fluid prehydration we should give 1 to 1.5 ml per kg for 24 hours and next uh, one, uh, same dose uh, post hydration 12 to 24 hours and we should uh, use this amount of contrast media and we should repeat a uh, uh, serum creatine level 48 to 72 hours to see if patient develops contest induced nephropathy or not. European Society of Cardiology Contest Induced Nephropathy Prevention Guidelines 2004, they recommended intravenous hydration with isotonic saline, isotonic saline. And if patient with very high risk or when prophylactic hydration is impossible, crucemide with uh, uh, matched hydration can be considered over standard hydration. That means 250 ml normal saline intravenously over 50 over 30 minutes with 0.25 to 5 milligram per kg of flucemide intravenous bolus. Hematoma, incidence is uh, 5 to 23 percent. It is the most common vascular exercise complication. Clinical features are a swelling mass surrounding the puncture site, heart, palpable, and tender. A small hematoma, if hemat diameter of hematoma less than 5 centimeter, large hematoma, if diameter more than 5 centimeter in diameter, can result in decrease in hemoglobin and blood pressure and increase in heart rate depending on severity. Picture showing groin hematoma. The groin or leg space are large and can hide large quantities of blood before evidence. Only evident within 24 hours of sheet removal. These factors, patient related these factors for vascular complications are female gender, low body weight, obesity, lower body surface area, older age, peripheral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease, 
low platelet count and procedural related risk factors are previous catheterization at the same site high dosage and lower duration of anticoagulant use of thrombolytic agent use of gp2b3 inhibitor larger arterial sheath concomitant venous sheath prolonged indwelling sheath duration prolonged procedural dilation and repeat pc and location of the arterial puncture so management homotomy is are uh, apply pressure to the site mark the area of evaluate for any change in size provide hydration monitor serial complete blood cell count maintain or prolong bed rest interrupt anticoagulation and antiplatelet medication if absolutely necessary blood transfusion if indicated if severe very rarely requires surgical evacuation many hematomas re resolve within a few weeks as the blood dissipates and is absorbed into the tissue signs of peritoneal bleeding and symptoms hypotension patient may develop hypotension bradycardia back or flank pain groin pain abdominal pain transient response to fluid loading great and sign bruising along flank and coolant sign bruising around umbilicus fluoroscopy uh, can uh, detect peritoneal uh, hemorrhage dented if uh, it is normally it is rounded bladder shadow in case of retroperitoneal hemorrhage dented blood shadow bladder shadow due to retroperitoneal hemorrhage it also can be diagnosed by ultrasonogram and ct of the abdomen now i'm showing one case where with a retroperitoneal hemorrhage a 60 years old female patient presented with non stmi diabetic hypertensive and a strong positive family history of ischemic heart disease and a moderate impairment of left ventricular ejection systolic uh, function 42% year coronary angiography revealed a 90 to 90% stenosis proximal part starting from origin involving bifurcation and rca dominant vessel having 70 to 80% stenosis in its proximal segment and 80 to 90% stenosis in its distal segment final result after the stenting after PCI patient shifted to post cat ward one hour later she complained of abdominal discomfort rapidly developed hypotension followed by shock check echo no pericardial effusion ecg only tachycardia no other changes clinically patient is paper white so we shifted patient to cath lab and angiography reveal a central jet of blood going to retroperitoneum from external iliac artery and 7.7 into 18 mm cover stent deployed at 20 atmosphere for 60 second and perforation sealed up by cover stent so management of peritoneal hemorrhage are uh, provide hydration perform serial blood cell count and hemoglobin estimation maintain or prolong bed rest interrupt anticoagulant and antiplatelet medication if necessary blood transfusion if indicated if severe site of bleeding should be promptly identified by angiography and treated with cover stent really may require surgical correction and evacuation now i'm presenting second case acute stent thrombosis a mr x 50 years old male hypertensive with chronic stable angina non diabetic non smoker underwent elective pci to led and lc pci done to led and pci done to lc patient was sent to post cat ward with good hemodynamics approximately 2 hours after procedure patient suddenly developed cardiac arrest followed by respiratory arrest immediately cpr started intubated and sent to cath lab cpr continued check cg done and there is uh, both uh, led and lcx occluded with thrombus and temporary pacemaker one done cpr started both bases were wired and repeated thrombus aspiration done and plain old balloon and the plastic done over done and there is no both vessel now visualized so stent thrombosis is complete 2% of coronary interventional procedure and associate with significant morbidity and mortality high risk of myocardial infarction i skip this slide already professor arun maski described it and uh, causes of stent thrombosis are stent related factors hypersensitivity to drug eluting drug coating or polymer incomplete endothelialization stent design and cover stent 
patient related factors are PCI for acute coronary syndrome because uh, they are very prone to uh, stent thrombosis. Diabetes mellitus, renal failure, impaired ventricular function, premature suggestion of gale antipilatory therapy, aspirin and clopidogrel non responsiveness, prior brachytherapy, malignancy, savinous based graft disease are more prone to stent thrombosis. And lesion length, if lesion uh, length or stent length is um, uh, long, then chance of stent thrombosis is more. Vessel and stent diameter, complex lesion, bifurcating lesion, chronic total occlusion, savinous vein graft lesion, and stasis. And positive related factors, inadequate stent expansion, incomplete stent apposition, stent deployment in necrotic port, residual age dissection. Acute stent thrombosis can be treated with balloon angioplasty alone. Repeat stenting is reserved for cases where dissection or other mechanical cause of stent thrombosis can be identified. Use of GP2B3 inhibitors. If clopidogrel resistant, then shift to prasugrel or tigagrel. Pseudoaneurysm. Though it is a late complication, so, but I discuss this. A pseudoaneurysm false, or false aneurysm is a communication between the femoral artery and the overlying fibromuscular tissue, resulting in a blood field cavity. Incidence of pseudoaneurysm is 0.5 to 9%. Low arterial excess, female gender, older age, diabetes, and obesity have been associated with pseudonymism formation, frequently result from failure to achieve adequate hemostasis after the catheter or CT is removed. The pseudonymism has continuity with the arterial lumen, whereas hematoma does not discontinuity with arterial lumen. Clinically, it is detected as a pulsatile mass with a brui adjacent to the site of femoral excess by Doppler eco. Doppler color flow imaging, it is detected as equilucent area, uh, extraluminal cavity in communication with common femoral uh, artery and with two and four of blood, uh, four of blood move flow during systole and diastole in ultrasound. Uh, management is small pseudonymism, less than three centimeters can typically be observed as they can respond clot spontaneously over time within four weeks. Ultrasound guided compression or Chemo stop device can also be used to compress a pseudoaneurysm, ultrasound guided percutaneous thrombin injection. Endovascular techniques such as coil embolization, detachable balloons, stain grafts have also been used. Indication for surgical treatment include rapid extension of the pseudoaneurysm, concomitant distal ischemia or neurological defeat, mycotic aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm, failure of percutaneous intervention, and compromised soft tissue viability. Arteriovenous fistula. Incidence of arteriovenous fistula is uh, 0.2 to 2.1%, a direct communication between an artery and a vein that occurs when the artery and vein are punctured. The communication occurs once the seat is removed. These factors are multiple stain excess attempts, punctures above or below proper site level in impaired floating. And clinical features are patient may be asymptomatic or with, there may be brui or thrill at excess site, swollen and tender extremity, distal arterial insufficiency or deep vent. Thrombosis can result in limb ischemia confirmed by ultrasonogram and management. Some arteriovenous fistula resolve spontaneously without intervention. Some may require ultrasound guided compression or surgical repair. Compartment syndrome. It is rare complication. It is uh, more common in uh, with uh, radial intervention. It is caused by raised pressure in a closed osseofacial space. Pressure more than 30 millimeter mercury gives raised to ischemia of forearm muscle. Cardinal sign is pain during dorsiflexion. Early detection is important and proximal compression may limit hematoma and mitigate the situation. Any sign of neurovascular deficit warrants urgent fasciotomy and or vascular surgery. There is figure showing swelling of the hand and there is two transradial band to stop bleed hemorrhage. Peripositional myocardial infarction. A new CKMB or topin I or T raise greater than five times the upper limit of normal will constitute a significant Peripositional myocardial infarction. Predictors of uh, peripositional myocardial infarction are complex lesion like presence of thrombus, stenosis, or savinous vein graft or type C lesion. Complex procedure, treatment of multiple lesion or use of rotational, uh, rotational atherectomy and associate completion like abrupt vessel closure, side bench occlusion, distal embolization, or no flow, no reflow. Advanced age, diabetes mellitus, renal failure, multivessel PCI, left ventricular dysfunction are the important determinants of clinical outcome of such PCI. The occurrence preposidal ischemic chest pain, particularly chest pain at the end of the procedure or electrocardiographic evidence of ischemia defines the subgroup of patients most likely to have preposidal MI. Treatment is based on the guidelines for managing acute coronary syndrome. From a meta-analysis of 20 studies included more than 
15,000 patients. Troponin elevation after PCI occurred in 32.9% of cases and was weakly associated with increased mortality at 3 to 67 month follow up. Sky defined periposital MI emerged as an independent, highly specific, but it is insensitive predictor of one year mortality. So, post PCI discharge management program includes safe monitoring in the immediate post PCI period. appropriately including secondary prevention and education on this factor modification and timely follow-up after first follow-up after four weeks thank you for patient hearing from our inter cath lab team thank you so, thank you dr kalim for your very focused and illustrative presentation. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah. Uh, so uh, now I would like to move to the next or the final speaker, uh, Dr. Mirish Takuzaman. He's a consultant cardiologist working at National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. And he will be speaking on the post-discharge follow-up of a patient after PCI in the, in the setting of general practice. Uh, uh, over to Dr. Mirish Takuzaman. And after he finishes, then we will have uh, the question and answer from the audience as well as the words of wisdom from the learned panelists. Over to Mirish Takuzaman. Thank you, sir. Uh, respected moderators and expert panelists, I'm Dr. Mirish Takuzaman, going to talk on post discharge follow up of uh, post PCA patients by general practitioners. Actually, Professor. Oren Mershke and Dr. Mohamed uh, Kalimul Zaman have covered a lot. So I think it will be easier for me to go through uh, these slides. So follow-up is always a integral part of a management plan for the post-PCI or any cardiac patients. So during discharge after post-intervention, we actually give lots of advice to the patients and as well as uh, we tell them what to do and not to do. So like uh, to prevent complications from puncture sites, we usually advise them to avoid excessive movements of the limb for the next two days. To prevent bleeding, patients should avoid carrying heavy objects or taking long automobile or bicycle rides or hikes for two weeks. And in case of radial artery punctures, patients should try to rest the affected hand for a few days. Also, to prevent recurrence of coronary events, uh, we tell them to be adhered to the medications. Lifestyle modifications need to be changed. In cardiac rehabilitation, uh, we offer them to enroll in the cardiac rehabilitation. And we also advise them to do self-monitoring with new symptoms or, or any other adverse, adverse effects from medications. So in follow-up after discharge, three points uh, that uh, we, sh we need to know. How should patients be follow up, followed up after coronary intervention? Who should see them in follow-up? And what aspects need to be considered? So in the early follow-up, or we can say it's a post-intervention follow-up, it should be done within seven days. And it be performed within one week by the patient's primary care physician, general practitioner, or internist, or other physicians responsible for further care. And after that, so patients goes into regular follow-up. Usually we do after one month, and then three to six monthly, and then if the patient's condition permits, then annually. In the first follow-up after discharge, partic particular attentions should be paid to problems at the puncture site, like bleeding, hematoma, aneurysm, AV fistula, and femoral nerve injury. All the conditions actually already been covered, but, but occasionally the patients also come with the femoral nerve injury, uh, complaining of uh, weakness in the limb. And if the patients are new, patient might develop new cardiac symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath. So in this case, we need to take these high-risk features of ischemic events, 
like patient's characteristics like his age, whether he is in 55 to 60 years of age, male sex, patient whether diabetic or not, or patients got chronic kidney disease. It, in which setting the patient has been gone through interventions, it also should be noted, like acute coronary syndrome, especially ST elevated MI, or prior stent thrombosis on adequate antiplatelet therapy. Type of flesh lesion should also be, uh, we need to know that whether it was unprotected left, may, uh, left coronary mainstain or multiple vessel disease, and the procedure characteristics, that's minimal stent diameter less than 2.5, total stent length more than 60 millimeter, at least three stents implanted, or at least three lesions treated, and stenting of the last remaining patent coronary artery. So proper clinical history and meticulous physical examination actually gives us a lot, a lot of uh, information. Not only uh, specific organs or general examination, we need also uh, to auscultate the limbs, especially for the uh, so for whether there is uh, pseudoneurysm, then we can find uh, a mar uh, the, uh, we can auscultate marmar, and we can also can see whether the hematoma is there or not. Among the routine investigations, twelve bead ECG, routine laboratory tests like uh, complete blood count, liver and venal function test, electrolytes, blood sugar, and urine. RME should be done. So what actually give uh, us those investigations as well as uh, clinical history and physical examination? We can find whether the patient is anemic. So if the hemoglobin drops more than two gram from the baseline, so it should be further evaluated and contrast induced nephropathy by doing creatinine uh, as already told by uh, Dr. Mohamed Kolimuddin. Uh, and we also, sometimes the patient uh, complains of, uh, about the statin intolerance. So if statin treatment has just been initiated, so if the patient develops muscle symptoms, so liver balance can give us a clue. And continuation of prescribed drug treatment, particularly of dual antiplatelet treatment of the stent implantation, it should be uh, reinforced again. And if the new cardiac symptoms or new ECG changes, so then the algorithm should be for acute coronary syndromes, which is covered by beautifully by Professor Oren Mashke. So I won't go through this stent thrombosis because it's, uh, and so then as a general practitioner, the patient should be referred to cardiologist or cardiac referral center. In the regular follow-up visits, the patient should be follow up, followed up regularly by their primary care physicians independ independently of any additional visits that may be necessitated by worsening symptoms, comorbidities, or any other tests that need to be done. So in this regular follow-up visits, the physician should take a clinical history focusing particularly on current symptoms, whether uh, specific cardiac symptoms persist or not, but also we need to ask about the fatigability or diminished performance of the patient, endurance level, functional status, including effects on family life, occupation, everyday activities, sports, and sexual activity should be asked. Emotional aspects sh uh, should be touched because the, uh, we know that after SES, especially after uh, ST elevated MI, more than 60% patients develop some symptoms of depression. The patient's psychosocial situations, conceptions of illness and behavior patterns like excessive cautions we need to know. And the goal is to communicate an optimistic attitude about the possibilities for treatment. The patient's tobacco use, nutrition and regular taking of medication should be assessed and control of other comorbidities, uh, control of other comorbidities also should be noted. The patient should be encouraged to change his or her behavior in health promoting ways. Physical examination should also be carried out with the starting for general examination and then uh, to specific organ examination, which will give us a, lots of clues to the underlying diagnosis. 
uh, restenosis actually uh, it's all already been uh, covered but still the most uh, common manifestations of clinical relevant restenosis is exercise induced angina followed by unstable angina and acute myocardial infarction so the routine investigations that we need to do is ecg complete blood count creatinine electrolytes blood sugars hb1c if the patient is diabetic it will give us a clue that whether the patient is uh, uh, well controlled or not a poorly controlled uh, diabetes sgpt first in lipid profile one month after initiation of statins in mi patients and three months in others then six monthly if the profile is uh, stable and uh, echo also should be done about the stress test and corner and coronary angiography routine stress testing after coronary interventions has no proven benefit and is not indicated routine ct angiography is not indicated after coronary stent implantation if symptomatic patients an imaging stress should be considered in patients with prior revascularization over stress ecg in general the indications for coronary angiography after pci are the same as those for primary coronary angiography if we look at the uh, guidelines esc guidelines so we can see in the symptomatic patients coronary angiography is recommended in patients with intermediate to high risk findings at stress testing plus one indications and imaging stress test should be considered in patients with prior revascularization over stress ecg is class 2a indication in asymptomatic patients surveillance by non invasive imaging based stress testing may be considered in high risk patients subsets 6 months after revascularization it's a 2b indication and after high risk pci like, uh, like unprotected left main stenosis uh, or late if 3 to 12 months surveillance angiography may be considered irrespective of symptoms and routine non invasive imaging based stress testing may be considered one year after pci and more than 5 years after cabg so when to refer to the cardiologist the primary care physician should refer the patient to the cardiologist whenever symptoms and signs arise that might be due to ischemic heart disease and cannot be adequately evaluated by the primary care physician alone now we need to uh, we uh, i think uh, often we face this uh, patient's concern we can say uh, sometimes patients comes to the clinic and complains about the localized chest pain at the site of stents so they think that after implantation of the stents at the site of the stents they develop chest pain often they have fear of excessive movement that they think the stent might go down or elsewhere so patients often looks apprehensive and sometimes they think the stenting put body in bad shape made feeling down patients look so depressive and uh all these uh, concerns actually because of the gap between the physicians and the patients so we need to clarify all the uh, course of the illness and the course of the pr procedure uh, to the patients so that patient uh, patient make himself comfortable and sometimes after one month of intervention patient became fatigue lost weight significantly after uh questioning or querying we can find that the patient actually stopped taking all the calorie intake because he thinks that it might cause a heart attack again sometimes patients stop statins because uh, fasting lipid profile is below normal level so they just stop uh, statins but they do not know what is the uh, uh, benef benefits of statins uh taking after cardiac events or after intervention and sometimes uh, they stopped uh, dual antiplatelet 
taking only aspirin as they think that P2Y12 inhibitor has same action. So why they should take these two drugs together? And sometimes, uh, often dentists told to stop DAPT for tooth extractions. Professor Arun Mashke actually covered a lot about this uh, non-cardiac surgery in post-intervention patients. So what I just uh, want to share that dental surgery is, a, is in low group, low risk group. So there is no need to stop both uh, uh, antiplatelet drug. This has also been covered by Orun, uh, Mashk, uh, Orun, Professor Orun Mashke sir, uh, about the non-cardiac surgery. But here, I, uh, I just uh, want to share that this depending upon the, uh, whether the surgery is emergency or semi-elective and elective and risk, uh, risk of thrombosis and risk of bleeding all should be considered uh, before stopping or continuing aspirin and clopidogrel. So myocardial devascularization must be accompanied by medical therapy and other secondary prevention strategies for risk factor modification and permanent lifestyle changes. Secondary prevention and cardiac rehabilitations are an integral part of management after devascularization. For the patients, it is a journey, not destinations. For physicians, we need to make this journey smooth, uh, easy and comfortable for the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ishraq, for your nice and elaborate presentation. Can you please uh, stop sharing your screen? Yes, OK. So uh, we have a very a galaxy of uh, stars in the uh, panel. So before we uh, hear them, uh, uh, there are some questions in the chat box uh, we, from the participants. Uh, so I request the speakers as well as uh, to uh, answer these questions. Uh, speaker, an anonymous participant, they choose to remain anonymous. There is a question that uh, the schedule of resumption of exercise and sexual activity after uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, uh, number one question, and the dose of aspirin uh, immediately after post-PCI. This is from the same speaker. Uh, anybody can uh, attempt to answer the question. At the time, uh, Professor Maskey was delivering his lecture. So uh, first of all, I request that Professor Maskey, do you have any opinion? Yeah, I mean, aspirin dose, uh, if you're uh, starting PCI, your yeah, loading dose is 300, and they recommend low dose as low as 75 to 100 is uh, recommended dose. And in our setting, we tend to give, for practical reasons, around 150 milligram of uh, aspirin, because sometimes we say the dose efficacy is something different. Like uh, we give clopidogrel, though not recommended, to give uh, 75 milligram twice daily. So ideally, 100 as low as 75 to 150 is good. And regarding sexual activities, is a low risk procedure. And for stable patients post PCI, if the patient is stable, can do normal activities, then they, they can continue. But for post PCI in acute coronary syndrome, they need to be stable. And it will take around at least four to six weeks. We have to assess functionally and then resume activities. Exactly. Any of the list? Uh, yeah. In our practice, also uh, we usually practice initial at least for one to two months with clopidogrel and aspirin in double dose. That is recommended by SCC and AHA. Uh, that is on 15 mg clopidogrel daily and on uh, 15 mg aspirin as well. And regarding the activity, uh, sexual and other activity, uh, we must be really. Uh, uh, 
uh, what he said is uh, that is uh, real after focus history assessment of the activity uh, physical activity and stress tolerance by physical activity is very important before going back to the normal activity in any patient with steady or non steady with PCR. But if the patient is having the chronic stable angina and now PCR is done, then after seven days he may go to normal activity. Okay. Uh, there is another question uh, from an anonymous uh, participant. Uh, if a patient is suffering from uh, it's an, uh, an operable cancer, when surgery is needed after PCI, what should be the approach? Well, uh, if uh, we'll have to find out what is a comorbid condition of patients. If the patient is elderly with many comorbid conditions, in that scenario, the aim of uh, PCI should be to improve quality of life. If a patient is healthy, young, with a long life, then we should think of doing complete revascularization in those patients. But the question of, uh, again, DAPT is there. If the surgery is emergency or is in, where you cannot wait, then this patient should uh, undergo surgery based on, on DAPT. But if this elective surgery, if the patient is on bare metal stents, you can go after one month. And if the patient is on uh, a dual and plate therapy with uh, DES, then ideally six months, but up to th uh, three months is reasonable. But before three months, there's a risk of stent thrombosis. So we'll have to judge patient uh, based on his clinical characteristics, what is his quality of life, how uh, young and other comorbid conditions. Yeah, can I add something? Uh, one thing is that the purpose here is to make the patient fit for the surgery. The surgery, the treatment of the cancer is the goal here. And the patient has to be made fit uh, for anesthesia. Uh, for that reason, we cannot wait too long. Now, if you use a bare metal stand, we can use DAPT, then continue the aspirin if possible, and on aspirin, the patient can undergo surgery. Most of the surgeries can be done. The second is, uh, we all we can also use the new generation stents because uh, on each certain energy they can be they there been studies have shown after one month of DAPT we can go for only one uh, single antiplatelet. That's another possibility. But in these cases, the primary goal be should be defined even in a patient who has triple vessel disease. We should identify the one which can make the patient relatively risk-free during anesthesia for the primary goal, that is treatment of the cancer. Thank you, Professor. Yes, that is very important. Sir. 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 Another is the extent, uh, how many vessels is extended and size of the extent is also important before stopping the DAPT or uh, going for surgery. Suppose long extent, narrow vessel, diffuse disease, uh, but if the patient is extended with a small suppose 3.5 or 4 millimeters, 12, 40 to 12 millimeters uh, extent, uh, even with newer DES, after three months, uh, I think certainly that can be stopped. Madam has got the huge experience regarding that one. Thank you, Rokin. Uh, actually, it, in this case, for cancer patient, I have even published a report on that case report. And yes. sometimes we have to be, uh, we have to stop the temptation of full revascularization. Because if you are using multiple states, the chances of equidistant okay. thrombosis when we stop the uh, dual antiplatelet is higher. Uh, we should pay attention to that. That's why I was saying, make the patient relatively free of risk, relatively during anesthesia, during the surgery, and go for it. Okay, thank you. I have one question. For the if the patient don't have any, uh, uh, is not symptomatic, suppose there is old MI, patient is not symptomatic, before doing the angiogram for, uh, with the aim of revascularization, whether we should go for stress test or not? I think the question was uh, different. The question was that if a patient who is having cancer needs a surgery, what should be the protocol of DAPT? That was the question, not the oh, okay. So the okay. protocol is 
the ESC protocol is if the patient is uh, having a VR metal stand, then DAPT can be safely stopped after one month and patient can undergo surgery. If the patient has undergone with the DS implantation, and if the surgery is emergence, life saving for the patient, DAPT can be stopped after three months. But if it is very urgent, very urgent, and is extremely life saving, then it can be stopped after one month also. That is what the protocol of. It depends on the urgency of the patient. If it's very urgent, then life of the patient is required. In that case, if it can stop after even after one month. Yes, but usually it is common that. They also, are, they also suggest continuation of aspirin alone no, during no. surgery. Uh, I think uh, most of the surgeons are a bit afraid of uh, doing surgery on aspirin. But the ESC recommendation is if the surgery is not a, uh, is an emergency, then it should be deferred for at least six months. If not possible, for three months. And if not, it's very urgent, then at least, at least one month. So it all depends on the urgency of the operation and the condition of the patient, not on the stent size or stent. Thank you, Professor Badiuzaman, for your nice comments. Uh, uh, there is a uh, three questions from Dr. Nizamul Hussain. The first question is: Is lifelong proton pump inhibitor necessary with continuation of dual antiplatelet therapy? Uh, our guest faculty, Colonel M. A. Malik is with us. Can I have your words of wisdom, please? Thank you very much, sir. Basically, uh, first of all, I'd like to give thanks to Heart Foundation for organizing such an important topics. Why I say it is important? Because uh, if you consider PCI, it can be done by the renowned lesion interventional cardiologist. It can be done by the even fellow. This PCI can be done in tertiary level, advanced center, high volume center, it can be done even in small center. The PCA can be done in type addition, it can be done in complex lesion, late main lesion. But follow up with the post PCA patient, that is very much important for every aspect of specialist, starting from the primary care physician up to the very lesion personality. For that, I must give thanks to the organizer for choosing these important topics. Now I come to the point. This is, a, this is a important topic chosen for the postgraduate student. So whatever I am uh, listening from last few minutes uh, regarding the, uh, during the discussion, uh, I am so lucky that there are three uh, important uh, my teachers who are here as a panelist. So I am very much lucky to, to, uh, from learning from the, these three important personality. These three, these classes is mainly for the postgraduate student. So I will try to highlight uh, for the student mainly, for the fellow, fellow, there are three important issues, uh, surgery and DOPT, antipeptic drug and duration. These important things basically is described in the ESC and SSC guideline in details. I will request the training to uh, uh, continue to read all those things. Now, if we come to the question regarding the DOPT and uh, proton pump inhibitor, if we look into the guideline, uh, EC guideline, only if a patient are high risk, high billing risk, and patient is taking dual antiperitoneal drug, then the recent guideline recommended for dual for proton pump inhibitor even lifelong. If patient is high risk for billing and patient is on the dual antiperitoneal dual antiperitoneal drug, this is the latest recommendation. Uh, another important thing I want to add here: during post PC follow up, if patient need in any emergency surgery, the even in presence of dual antiplatelet, if patient develops very life threatening surgical condition, we must go for the surgery in presence of dual antiplatelet. So it does not matter what are the drugs patient is taking. It is the scenery of the surgery which dictates what what types of uh, what how long you will continue the dual antiplatelet drug and what antiplatelet drug you need to stop now. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a, another question. Uh, the the uh, participant wants to know reduction and stopping of anti-platelet drugs in relation to platelet count. I would request uh, Professor Fuzila, Madam, to uh, deliver some words of wisdom on this question.
actually, um, I would say, I, I mean, I'm not really an expert on this. I think Wadud has more experience, uh, but what I feel is that if the platelet count is actually low, then I would give the, I would continue the dual antiplatelet, but I would give it at the lower possible dose. And I remember Khaled, you presented a case once of a, the, a very complex case that you did. You presented it an, in one of our conferences where the platelet count was low. And you said, I remember if I'm not wrong, you said that, I mean, this low platelet count actually might not completely correlate with the thrombogenicity of that person. I mean, that was like three, four years ago that you presented that case, right? And you said that you gave the patient dual antiplatelet, you continue to do that. So you are more qualified to tell me about what you did because he, he has a practical experience where he was treating a patient who had definite thrombocytopenia, right? So yes. what did you do, Khaled? Thanks for remembering, ma'am. It was a case of uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia with autoimmune hepatitis, with what we call is Evans syndrome. Uh, the, the patient had a platelet count of around uh, 30,000. And the low platelet count doesn't mean that the thrombogenicity of the platelet is reduced. The abnormal platelets can be more thrombogenic. And at that time, uh, when we did the case, the bivalrudine was not available in our case to use the traditional uh, 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 heparin and we use the bare metal stent and we uh, gave uh, clopidogrel for a very short time. Actually, the clopidogrel we need to avoid because clopidogrel can directly cause thrombocytopenia. Uh, so if, we, if we, there is a tendency of uh, reducing platelet count, we better change to ticagrelor. Uh, uh, it is a relatively safer drug and we don't need to worry too much, but the patient is sometimes worried. If the platelet count is uh, less than 100,000 or if there is no spontaneous bleeding, so we need to safely continue with the antiplatelet agents, but we need to check whether there is any bleeding and we have to change the drug in time. So any other analyst who would like to comment on this issue? Can I? I have one question. What would I want to learn from you? So, you know, our patients get very worried by what shall I say, minor beats, right? Like bruising. Uh, then, you know, uh, they get very echinosis. These are very, you know, the whole family gets worried. The wife gets worried. The daughter gets worried. So, how do you reassure these patients that okay, don't worry? What do you do? Uh, what do you do? Uh, uh, I have done a PCI in a ITP patient, a triple vessel disease, three arteries, very discreet lesion, type A lesion, and very tight. All are 99 to 95%. And I have done the three vessel, the patient is well. The patient initially have very low platelet count. The hematologist treated it, raised the count around 100,000 o'clock. Then I go for the PCI and the patient is doing well nicely. The point is hematologists say, if the platelet count is 1 lakh or more, 100,000 or more, you can use dual antiplatelet. Preferably, as Khaled Bhai has, avoid the clopidogrel, you can use ticagrelor. But here, someone suggested that ticagrelor at a lower dose, 60 mg twice daily would have been better, which is not available in our country, but available in the neighboring country. The third point is, if the count is 50,000, you can use uh, a dual antiplatelet, but very carefully, you have to uh, regularly follow. Below 50,000, below 30,000, you should use only one single antiplatelet, and even then careful. That's what they, they ask, uh, the hematologist, they are from their point of view. I have seen patient who has undergone bypass event with a platelet count around 20,000, regular platelet count. He never used any antiplatelet. He underwent surgery in, uh, in India and he didn't have any problem. I have seen the patient on third year of follow-up, but we have never been able to use any uh, antiplatelet. Okay, thank you. There is another very uh, pertinent... Sir, I, have a, sir, I have a question to Professor Wadu, sir. Yes, Professor Malik. Sir, the question is that in a PCI patient, within one week of the PCI, if he developed dengue fever 
his, his initial platelet count is 130,000. And on subsequent day, his platelet count is 110,000. Sir, would you recommend continuation of the anti platelet drug in this clinical scenario? Patient post PCA patient and his patient is suffering from dengue fever. Sir, you are unmute. Please unmute, sir. Vadud, unmute. Please unmute, Professor Vadud. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, in that case, you have to be very careful because he, he, these aspirin operators, they are irreversible inhibitor of uh, uh, platelets. So it's better to use reversible uh, platelet inhibitor like ticagrelor. That's been, that one is better. And I would have choose only ticagrelor for the period. Stopping the aspirin, don't using the clopidogrel, which are permanent inhibitors in that case. And I would look after it. If the count is 50,000 below, I would stop it temporarily. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Vadud. Uh, there is another very interesting question from Dr. Mamun Reza. If a patient develops hemorrhagic cerebrovascular disease after PCI, what will be the adjustment in antiplatelet and anticoagulants? Uh, I don't know whether you have that experience. I have two patients. One even is my relative. Both of them survive, and my relative is doing very well after 10 years even. But another patient I have lost in follow-up, up to one year I know that that patient survived. The point is, you have to stop all anti -plaking. You cannot do anything about it. That's the point. And the neurosurgeon saying, you can restart anti only after around 10 to 14 days, single anti very cautiously not before that. Preferably they wish that we should start it after four weeks. There is no clear cut consensus or guideline about that. Uh, Orun, do you have any idea about that? I haven't gone through any. No, I have no idea. What uh, they recommend is do CT scan, CT confirm scan. the size has not increased, it's uh, stable, and then you can add uh, aspirin Again, we check if it has not increased in size, then continue. That's what the recommendation says, yes. but there's no consensus. Consensus. Uh, uh, there is another question uh, from Dr. But, uh, but even that after one week, yeah. one week to 10 days, they yeah. wait for that. I think the relook neuroimaging is very important because the, actually the hematoma, whether it is uh, increasing or it remains static or it is decreasing, that is very important. And sometimes, uh, I have seen in the neuro ICU, they give platelet apheresis in the patient to, uh, as already the patient's native platelets are dysfunctional. So to arrest further bleeding, the neuro in, uh, interventionists or neuro intensivists, they produce, give platelet apheresis to arrest further bleeding in this group of patients. Uh, okay. The another question, interesting question is, what uh, to do if a patient develops uh, statin intolerance after PCI. Uh, what are the options? Uh, the learned panelists, anyone can answer this question or the speakers? I think regarding the uh, statin intolerance, what does it mean actually? What, is it I, that just simply, simply the r r rising of the uh, liver enzyme or patient having cramps of the muscles or what? What does it mean actually? If it is only patient is okay, but the liver enzyme has increased, then actually we do stop uh, liver uh, if it is more than two and a half times the normal. Uh, until, and otherwise, uh, we just reduce the dose. And it is said that rosuvastatin has a lesser uh, tendency to increase uh, SGPT. But if it is, it is more than, for example, 200 or more SGPT, then we stop it. And if the patient develops cramps and intolerable cramps, then it is no way that then you have to stop it. Uh, and then gradually uh, increase in lower dose. It all depends on the situation of the patient, actually. Do we need to... Can I, can I add something? Sure. Yes. If the patient develops myositis, statin is absolutely contradictory. You cannot use it anymore. If you have rising liver enzyme, very interestingly, stop the statin, use arsodeoxycholic acid, and reach start at a lower dose, preferably rosuvastatin, after two weeks. You will find out you are not having any problem. The third is, if the patient cannot tolerate statin, some people have uh, some sort of uh, allergic reaction or something, 
Use another statin. You may find out the patient can tolerate another statin well. In general, rosuvastatin is better tolerated. Regarding the SCPT rise, pravastatin is probably the most uh, suitable one, but we don't have that. But rosuvastatin is better. Another but myositis, if you have to uh, uh, withdraw it. Uh, I think it. another uh, choice is ezetimide. You can try ezetimide if there is no other option. Achha, can I add something else? Studies have shown myositis and myalgia are two different things. Many patient studies have shown placebo control trial they have done given same type of medicine tablet to one is containing only placebo one is statin both group having similar degree of myalgia not myositis myalgia so myalgia is more subjective when you tell the patient no you are not having the proper medicine even those having statin they develop lesser symptoms when there is some sort of psychological component is there so myalgia and myositis should be differentiated. Give okay. reaction to the patient, lower dose, change the statin brand. Can we do those at total CPK MM, specific muscle muscle enzyme and to see the, if it is highly raised, then it should stop the, I think CPK can be done. If you then are CPK, aldolase, these two. Okay. Tenfold rise of CPK is an absolute indication of stopping statin. And threefold rise of ALT. These are the two parameters which has been mentioned in the guideline. So, as Professor Bodhijaman has said, we can try ezetimide. It is a very safe drug, but it is not that effective in plaque stabilization, possibly. Uh, there is a, uh, another question. Uh, is it mandatory I, uh, to give a loading dose of antiplatelet before? I, I don't think it is very relevant, but still it is worth discussing. Loading dose of antiplatelet, is it mandatory before PCI, elective PCI? Sorry, yeah. Any of the panelists or speakers? Yeah. Or yeah. If, uh, if you are giving any elective or primary PCI, the previously concept, uh, you give a 300 uh, milligram aspirin and clopidogrel, you have to load because if you give clopidogrel, 300, it takes around six hours to act. If you give 600, it takes around two hours to act. So if the patient is not on any of this uh, DAPT, better load it and the action comes early and the risk of uh, centromos is uh, very less. Actually, if the patient is already on antiplatelet, for example, the patient is already on aspirin and clopidogrel for a long time, now he is on... No, the recommendation is if the patient is on clopidogrel for five days or more, then you do not uh, need to load clopidogrel. And uh, that, that's what I did. But if you are using another antiplatelet, for example, a patient on aspirin clopidogrel, now you are going to do PCI, you want to use the ticagrelor, you have to give the loading dose of the ticagrelor. Yeah, you have to give. Uh, that you have to do. That's true. Uh, that's what I uh, Regarding static, can I add anything, uh, another thing? Patients with hypothyroidism, patients with hypokalemia, patients with CKD, these three groups, be careful. They have more uh, myalgia, myositis, revenge problem, other things. Using the statin, be careful about in these three groups. Uh, we are fortunate that we are not using uh, many doses of simvastatin because simvastatin is very notorious for causing myositis and myalgia. Actually. But in USA and UK, uh, they are using a lot of simvastatin still nowadays. Yeah. Because the cost concerns actually it's cheap so uh, another question is it uh, mandatory to use statin even after four years of pci i think it is on uh, uh, can i say something the celebrated cardiologist eugene brownwald he became 90 this year he is using statin from the very beginning His LDL is uh, very well and functional. And he says, I'm living proof, use the starting lifelong. I think starting should be used lifelong. Uh, it, it, it is not only that it is reduced uh, uh, cholesterol, it also has uh, some anti inflammatory and plaque st stabilization function. So it should be uh, uh, continued until, unless the patient has some other uh, side effect from this starting. Otherwise, it should be continued indefinitely. Once a patient has documented skin heart disease, then it should be continued.
two things, uh, two drugs, you should take life on one aspirin and another is uh, lipid loading okay. drugs. May I ask a question now? Please. If a patient have typical angina, uh, let's say uh, so-called microvascular angina syndrome X, should we be giving antiplatelet at all to this group of patients? It's still a controversy. Microvascular, uh, we are it's not we are not yet clear about the pathogenesis and yeah. mechanism and because microvascular. Yeah. Somebody tells that ecosprin may induce microvascular ischemia, my spasm. So okay. somebody okay. changes the antiplatelet to clopidogrel or other version. Uh, so actually, one one yes. interesting finding is that aspirin inhibits collateral growth. That, that's, that's very that's surprising. That's and if you use the nitrate. Nitrate reverses that problem. Yeah. And if the epicardial coronary artery is normal, no study have shown antiplatelet uh, provides any benefit. But actually, uh, this uh, on, uh, the ESC Congress, sorry, the Euro PCR Congress this time, which was done online, there was a topic on uh, INOCA. INOCA means ischemia with normal coronary artery, INOCA. So they were thinking about that this, must, this patient might have a microvascular uh, disease. So their consensus was that uh, it should include antiplatelet drug. Yes, but not a screen. Clopidogrel preferable. Yes. There should be an antiplatelet drug. There should be a statin. There should be other uh, uh, pimetazine, ranalazine. These all drugs were recommended in this uh, recent Euro PCR. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Nepal. Our regular attendee, Samir Pudel, has uh, put one question. A patient with uh, a chronic liver disease with prolonged prothrombin time with uh, some bruise and ecchymosis. He develops acute coronary syndrome and needs a PCI. Uh, how we can manage the uh, DAPT in this case? So in a setting of uh, chronic liver disease with coagulopathy. Uh, it can be uh, before uh, PCI or after PCI as well. So how we can manage the dual antiplatelet in this situation? Learned panelists, anyone? Can, any, I, can I participate? Yes, please. Please, Colonel Malek, you can. What, what I want to emphasize here, which are not written in the guideline, and when there is some complicated scenario like this, if patient is uh, suffering from chronic liver disease, these patients are vulnerable to develop coagulation abnormality. Again, these group of patients are very much likely to develop steadily induced hepatitis. So whenever we are dealing with this type of patient, we have to judge the patient individually. Suppose the patient is suffering from chronic liver disease and his liver function is normal. Ultrasound card shows only post liver. And if patient is post-PCI within six months, from my side, I think this patient should get full course of treatment with regular follow-up. And if patient has got coagulation abnormality, suppose if patient is high PT or INR, then we should, uh, we should uh, think the condition. If patient has got acidosis plus high INR, we should stop anti plantar drug. What I want to say here, suppose the patient is suffering from, uh, a patient has got post PCI within last one week, and patient has developed acute GIV. So it is mandatory to stop anti plantar drug. In any life, like intracranial hemorrhage with post PCI, acute GI bleeding with post-PCI, like any acute scenario, if there is any acute scenario complicating bleeding, then we should stop antiplatelet drug first. After recovering from the bleeding scenario or progression problem, then we should gradually escalate the dose of antiplatelet drug, considering the liver scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Malik, the, the question was also included, diagnose chronic liver disease, now having SCS. That's needing immediate intervention, how are you going to use the antithrombotic antiplatelet regime? Because the patient with CLD uh, should must have a coagulopathy. So actually, I think it, it, uh, APTT or PT should be done uh, to see the coagulopathy status of the patient. And uh, it depends on the level of the uh, coagulopathy patient having due to chronic liver disease. If it is mild form, uh, the APTT should be, uh, can continue uh, with safety. But if it is an acute fulminating hepatitis or something which has very uh, moderately severe condition, then I think uh, we should reconsider uh, doing a single antiplatelet and all of the patients. Because uh, that is antiplatelet and that is anticoagulant. There's different uh, mechanism of action. Liver, liver, is, liver disease is producing 
anticoagulant. It, 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 it increases APTP or PT, but uh, sorry, and uh, yeah, we are doing antiplatelet. So these are different. Antiplatelet and anticoagulant are two different issues. The anticoagulant okay. and antiplatelet should not overlap with each other. So in this yeah, can I add something? Uh, sure. Would it be helpful than heparin? Can I add something? Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah. One thing is that, uh, uh, as Bodhijan Bhai has said, uh, consider a thrombus. It's a wall. The wall is formed of bricks, that's platelet, and the cement, that the matrix is coagulant factors. So here the coagulant factors are deficient. So we should be careful about using heparin. And also you should remember, CLD patients have lower platelet count. And this they have low greater bleeding. And also, CLD patients have spherical phases. We don't know about the phasial status. So, if I want to use it, I would be using dual antiplatelet very quickly with one including ticagello that's reversible and stopping the spin very quickly. And using, preferably, as uh, uh, Ashok was mentioning, by routine, I would have preferred. Or heparin, very low dose. Okay, and you. then going for uh, other precaution, regular check. Professor Vadud, and patients with chronic liver disease also likely to have hypersplenism as well, leading to exactly they have lower plate plate count because of that. You are right. Yeah. Uh, so we are finished with the question in the chat box. We'll have the opinion of our learned panelists. First of all, I will. I have one question to Arush sir. Yeah, please. Suppose patient patient with PCI having dual antiplatelet. 75 and 75 milligram aspirin and clopidogrel. Is there any uh, relation with the subcutaneous GUI or echymosis with increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage? The point is, aspirin sensitivity, aspirin inhibitor effect on the platelet, it varies from person to person. Some people are very susceptible to activity of antiplatelet, particular antiplatelet. So some people have. Uh, at a lower dose, more anti platelet depressant effect. Some people have very less. Some people therefore will have bruise, some will not. What I would prefer? I would have preferred in those cases lower dose of anti -platelet. I would have given prasugrel 5 milligram or in case of ticagrel, I would have preferred 60 milligram twice daily. Some studies suggested, but I do not have not undergone any consensus statement on that. These are all personal experience-based uh, studies and uh, case reports. No, anyhow, uh, uh, has it got any in, uh, relation with increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage? The dose uh, hemorrhage, there is increased chance of intracranial hemorrhage like this. Prasugrel has the highest tendency of developing intracranial hemorrhage. Yes. The second is uh, clopidogrel, lowest is uh, ticagrel. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the lipid management, sir. I have got on uh, uh, just uh, American College of Endocrinology has got uh, a recommendation 2016. Any patient with HCS, uh, any patient, their uh, target LDL level should be less than 70. And if any harm with PCI subsequently develops again angina, LDL level should be less than 55. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ashok, for your nice uh, comments. Uh, now I would uh, come to our uh, learned panelists. First of all, I would uh, like to come to our chief consultant, uh, Professor Fadila Malik. In, uh, in the advanced country, patients undergoing coronary revascularization, including PCI, need to enroll to a formal cardiac rehabilitation program, which we don't have in our country. So do you find this as, as a hindrance to a proper follow-up of uh, PCI patients, actually, because we don't have, uh, uh, don't have an organized uh, cardiac rehabilitation program? And, and your overall opinion on this uh, today's presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank Madam. you. Thank you, uh, Khalid Mosin, for uh, moderating this very interesting session. And uh, it was truly interesting. And initially, there was a bit of concerned that the topics are same, but actually three speakers spoke of three diff very different aspects of the same problem of how do we best manage our post-PCI patients. And they, the, all of them, they did such a great job, and I must congratulate all of them. Thank you so much. And you did a great job of moderation. Thank you. And I would also like to thank 
our guest panel of experts, Madhud, is sort of a semi out. He's not really a guest because he is a part of us now. And I welcome Kondan Malik for coming this first time. We're very grateful that you joined us and uh, we're very active. Thank you so much. And about the rehabilitation question, Khalid, this is the burning question. We do need a rehabilitation center. And that would be a godsend for our patients and it would make life so much easier for us. And I totally agree with you. Actually, we had a very great plan of starting a rehabilitation project in our hospital, but it has, due to this sudden appearance of COVID, uh, been sort of shelved, but we hope to have it open again. And actually, Ishrak was sort of leading the project. He had a lot of ideas and we were working on that. So hopefully in the future, inshallah, we will get there. Right, Ishra? So yes, Ishra yes. still has <laughs> hopes of, uh, yes. and we Actually, definitely Madam, have hopes have of starting a rehabilitation also. project. We have all these big ideas that we want to implement. And yes. we had the floor with all the materials there. It's yes, we have we also, we even have a total floor which has been dedicated to rehabilitation. We just need to set it up. We have the space and everything. Okay, thank you, ma'am, for your futuristic remarks. We hope to uh, reach that goal as soon as possible. And now I would like to request Professor Bodhisattvaman for his uh, final comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, session, actually. Actually, uh, it was a very important session. And uh, I think it was very important for the general physicians also. I don't know how much of them have participated. Because all the patients who undergo the PCI and ultimately prefer majority of them are followed up in the rural area in the in the district level by the physicians. So it's a very important question. Thank you all the speakers, uh, Professor Arun Masli, Dr. Ishak, and Dr. Kalimuddin. Thank you very much for your very enlightening lectures that given. Arun Masli lecture was very good. Thank you very much. And thank you all the panelists and thank you, Harish Masli. We have moderated really, as Professor Ali, Professor Ali has said, we have moderated very well. Been interesting. You have made this. You have made this uh, uh, session interesting. Your model. Thank you very much, Professor Vadud. Your final comments. Uh, as everybody is saying, actually today's session was very important. And uh, as Bodhijan Bhai was saying, we wish many of the general practitioners attended the session. They would have been better. But what I want. Uh, for Jilapa, I would suggest to for Jilapa, can we take the uh, basic part of the how to how to do the physical activity, how to act, uh, money, uh, start the sexual activity, what sort of diet they should do, and riding, driving, all those things. Can I make a gist of it and make a uh, sort of Zoom meeting for general practitioners in future? Just one single lecture, but very simple things. What should do, what they should do about the anti days or the startings if the patient has myalgia, what to do. But they right. have to have some guidance. That will be a very good idea. And today's lectures, uh, not only it was surprisingly good. very good. Mm -hmm. And Maski, thank you. You have done a lot of research and I have just recorded it. So it will be a very helpful thing for all, all of us and everyone else, Ishtag and Kalim. As always, you two have done a nice, very nice job. Thank you. And Fadilapa and Khaled Bhai, thank you again for letting us in this session. Professor Maski, your final comments? Oh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Khaled Bhai. As a student, I feel privileged to talk in front of you. Thank you very much. And Bodhijan and Bhai, Professor Vadu also, and everybody, thank you. For joining it was a and great lecture, giving, Maski. We uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you, ma'am. It was a great lecture. So, Professor Colonel Abdul Malik, your final words of wisdom, please. In terms of uh, my food, respect to teach, I have nothing to comment because it is an educational forum. So, I want to have some uh, point uh, to share with my junior colleague. As all post appreciate the shell, there are two important enemies one is stem thrombosis, another is in To me, stem thrombosis is a disaster scenario for the patient and for the physician. For, the, for patient, 
it carries risk of life for finisher in bigger than credibility of the international carnivores. So we should be very, we all know that uh, if you consider the risk factor for the stem thrombosis, no factors are there except well and detected after PCI. All other factors during procedure or before procedure. So I will request uh, to for all my junior colleagues during follow up of the PCI patient, we must ensure uh, the post uh, dual antibody drug. Another thing, just very important point I want to highlight, one of my mentor, Professor Ashok Shah, while I was working with him, he was telling me there are only five drugs in the cardiology, AC inhibitor, beta blocker, antiplatelet, statin, anticoagulant. We must know how to deal with all these five drugs. When we start, what should be done, what should be the optimum side effect, and what should be the optimum duration. So we should always consider while we will follow up the patient regarding the drug of the post-pressure patient. I must tell all the speakers because it was wonderful lectures. I have all the uh, uh, good feelings for them. Special thanks to Professor Arun Maski because he has taken very good initiative from abroad and he has given very good lesson to us. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. I, I saw a glimpse of Professor Tuhin Hawk. Professor Tuhin, are you with us still now? Probably she has left. She left, uh, yeah. Uh, waiting for a long, long time. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Professor, uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Dhiman Banik. Dhiman, are you with us? Dhiman? Yes, I'm with you. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, very nice presentation. Uh, I have learned many things from. In addition, I want to uh, uh, have the panelists discuss a few words about using uh, diabetics in patient with uh, PCI, uh, PCI with low ejection fraction and with CKD and uh, some uh, and other two drugs that are the primatazidine and uh, ranolazine and uh, and a patient with PCI with high triglyceride level uh, with CKD. What is the uh, uh, plan of uh, treatment in patients with uh, PCI. These four things, uh, diuretics using tri, uh, tri metazidine, ranolazine and uh, uh, enofibrate in patients with CKD because this is the important because most of the PCI patients have CKD and how will we level because we see that we are giving diuretics in patients with uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction with uh, PCI and outside uh, diuretics are stopped and the patient comes to us with failure at night and they are dropping in everything is normal then again the diuretics should be restarted again and what should be the management and when uh, this should be stopped or these uh, things I think uh, is almost uh, we talk more mostly about the antiplatelets uh, can it be discussed for a while Yes, Diman, thank you very much for your nice uh, insights to further elaboration of the pharmacologic spectrum. But today, I think we are uh, uh, running short of time. We can discuss these issues. These are very important. We definitely we can discuss it. Uh, thank you for your uh, input. Now, I would request uh, Associate Professor Dr. Tofik Shahriar Hawk for your valuable comments on the, today's lecture. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for uh, asking to say a few words. I enjoyed the lectures very much. As all the panelists agreed, this is really a very important topic. We can do PCI, but whether how the PCI patients are going to do in the long run depends on their follow-up. Uh, so this was a very important lecture, and all the three lecturers covered the topic from different angles. And I think uh, I really enjoyed it, and I thank uh, everyone for this. That's all, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tofik Shariar. Now I would request uh, Dr. Assistant Professor Dr. Muhammad Kalimuddin to deliver his final remarks on today's program. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, is, it was a really enjoying lecture, and uh, I particularly enjoyed lecture of Professor Ogun Maski, who covered all the things, particularly important for not only a general physician, also for uh, a cardiologist, beginner, a beginner cardiologist. And uh, Dr. Ishtak also told about uh, post-PCI follow-up. He also 
uh, yeah, highlighted some important things uh, with patient concern about this that the stain goes down, that the pain in stain side. It is also we should uh, reassure this patient about that stain never move uh, while if we put the stain. And uh, thank you, sir, very much for moderating this question and uh, moderating this session. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ashok Dutta, do you have any final okay. remarks? No, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I'd like to request uh, uh, Fujila ma'am and also uh, ICDI uh, Professor Rodi Chaudhary sir regarding the post-PCI and also the post-MI patient management uh, for the, not only the cardiology, but also for general practice and inter internet. That is very important. And I'd like to uh, thank all the three speakers. Great job they have done. And I, actually, I have uh, I really learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, uh, consultant Dr. Mir Ishtakuz Zaman, your final remarks, please. Sir, so, thank you, sir. I'm really lucky to be here. And you know, when you listen to all these experts, and uh, so it enlightens your knowledge too much. So I, I'm really lucky. So thank you all, sir. Uh, thanks for this uh, beautiful. Uh, how to tell you this beautiful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ishtar. If anybody has uh, got to speak any final words, I uh, request them to do so. And if not, I would like to thank Inceptor Pharmaceuticals uh, for, uh, for their uh, technical support in organizing this very innovative educational venture. And uh, I would, uh, I'd like to thank the Academic Council of National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute for continuously organizing this type of educational endeavors to enrich the senior, mid-level, and the junior cardiologists. And uh, if uh, there is no other issues to discuss, I would like to conclude today's session with the kind permission of the chairperson. Uh, our respected mentor uh, and chief consultant, Professor Fadilatun Nesamali. Uh, I would uh, like to end today's program. Wish you uh, a nice uh, evening and hope to see you in our next program in a greater number and with greater enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.